Good evening, everyone, on both the Zoom line and the phone line. It's great to see everyone here tonight. Those of you who are even coming on the Zoom line, and it's great to have got on early enough to have heard the voice of those on the prayer line. I want to take a moment, and um, for those who are on the Zoom line, and ask you to look at Sister Simpson's uh, screen, and she is modeling today our Expectation Moment shirt. Now, I want to encourage everyone again to get you an Expectation Moment shirt. Get you one. And rock it this fall. We're gonna be the, the, the long I'm sleeve I'm coming in um shortly, and you can have your long sleeve expectation shirt. But if you go to the gym, you might want to have one of each. And so we want you to get them. Remember that they're 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 good conversation pieces so that we can exercise of what we've learned about living the expectation this year. They're also very uh handy and they're washable and they don't shrink much. And I like to say they don't shrink much. So I um <laughs> I I've washed mine countless times and it still fits, and so therefore I know that it doesn't shrink much. Because I my shirts tend to shrink and make get small on me because I'm not gaining any weight, so I know it's a shirt. But this shirt doesn't shrink. Uh, please join us uh, with and get you an expectation moment shirt. Uh, and finally, the, the proceeds will be going to uh, the St. Peter uh, the, the the ministry work that we keep that we're capable to uh, continue to do daily. I also want to take a moment to give a praise out to the Lord. Give God praise. Um, we have this just this week. Um, God has well. Several weeks ago, I should start off by saying that God gave us an opportunity to um, to um, ask for, to, to the, I, and the Lord put on my heart. I shared it, and Sister Simpson, Sister Thompson jumped right on. Sister Thompson jumped right on top of it. We asked for those who were interested in getting a computer uh, to be used for expectation moment, but also to be used for whatever is your computer. But we asked you to do participate in expectation moment, and so I asked God, and this is how I know that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. I was initially reaching out to friends, uh, asking them to. Um, give me the computers they didn't use anymore so we could refurbish them. We did get some of those, um, but God then saw fit to send us some new computers. So this week we got a shipment of, of uh, several computers uh, that will be available for those who some, I think we have a list, but it, I, I guess I say all that to say this. If you are on the phone and you say, I wish I could be on Zoom. Well, God is about to answer that prayer. Um, it call the church, 758-4462. Uh, Sister Thomas is there Monday through Wednesday. Is that right? Um, and she will answer the call and write your name down. And, yeah. and I believe that God is going to give us a provision to meet the needs of all of those who um, who um, who are interested in, in, in participating in Zoom. I don't want you to think we're not going back to church. We are. But but here's the truth. We're going to be doing a lot of virtual stuff while we're doing um, it, um, um, in-person stuff. So it's called hybrid. We're going to be doing hybrid stuff. So what I believe, and it gives us an opportunity for everybody to participate um, in, in a variety of things. In other words, when we have women's ministries. Let's say, for example, you can't make it that Sunday. You, can, you don't have to miss it. You can still tune in. And so God has given us the vision for that. We're going to begin to implement it. Uh, I know people say they worry about their hair. Don't worry about your hair. I love to see your face. I love to see your face. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and so I just want to encourage everybody on that. If you're interested, call the church. God has blessed us. He's going to keep blessing us because it's, it's, it is his will that we come together, study his word. Uh, but you remember, it's your computer. You can do your doctor's appointments on it. You can, you can FaceTime your children or whatever. But we also, but we want you to be a part of this. And so if you're interested, um, call the church, give me your name. And I'm just, I, and I'm living in expectations that God can keep sending them. Yes. I didn't even, I wasn't even paying attention. Somebody called and said, hey, we got some, got, got something about the computers. And right after that, it happened. Sister Reese donated some, a couple of other people donated some. They're available as well. But um, our partner, Humana, who's been very kind of sent, sent got us seven. Um, Sister Blackman actually ordered them for us. But and Sister Simpson is, what well, tell me, Sister Simpson, you are sending them up, um, helping people get acclimated to them. And you know, so it's been a part. It's been a teamwork, team working together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember Elder Stan, uh, Elder Flanagan said, um, work, um, "Working together, it's also said working together team works." Teamwork makes the team. Work. Team work. That's right. That's right. That's and so I'm grateful that God is moving in such a way, and the church is working together in this season for this great work. And so I thank God for that program, that that process, that that those blessings. I thank God for all of you who are on tonight who have just kept coming on the phone and Zoom line. I thank God for the vision, and I thank God for the ministers who have just continuously been teaching so faithfully. And I thank um, Reverend, Kent, uh, Reverend, um, Reverend, um, Reverend mm -hmm. McClatt for being on tonight. I was looking for her, but I forgot she's on her mom's computer, um, for, for teaching the last two nights in such an able way. Tonight, we're going to continue in Chapter 4 of James. Um, I know that last time, last two times we've been together, James has hit us hard. He gave us a couple of body shots, but it helped us. I pray that we heard it and receive it 
accept it and walk in it because James is simply as given by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He is sharing with us those things that we need to do as a body of believers that we may be effective in glorifying him, but also have the peace that he desires us to have in our lives. Sometimes we think of peace just in terms of peace with God, and that's the most important thing. But God, as we have God, peace with God, God wants us to have peace with one another. All right. I think I said it again. As we have peace with God, God desires that we have peace with one another. And that's what John, uh, James has shared with us in these early verses of James chapter um, four and, and then throughout this book. Um, in chapter four, verse the early verses, he, he rebukes um, us for worldliness. Fight, what does he mean? Fightings and wars and, and issues and, 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 and lust in our members and, 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 and fighting and again, warring. He, he challenged us on asking for the right things. Uh, he said, you ask not and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. He said, you're asking the wrong things. In verse 4, he talks about adulterers and adulteresses. Again, that's not just, a, it's about the sexual aspect, but also about just the total, total aspect of making, putting somebody, putting anything or anybody before God. He establishes that to be, uh, to put the world first is to become an enemy with God. Um, then he moves on in verse 5 to tell us, um, that there's a spirit in us, that's the carnal flesh that lifts us to envy, that there's an envy, envy that lusts and desires to envy. Envy leads to other issues. And then verse six and seven and eight, um, and that's why I want to pause for a moment tonight. He gives us again what I consider to be some great spiritual apostolic insight into the Christian life. So let me start at chapter four, verse six, and then we'll pick up some speed. But I want to touch on this again. So here's what he says. But he gives more grace. That means that God, despite our weakness, has grace enough to give us what we need. In other words, God's grace is greater than even our, our ability to sin. Now, that mean we, as Paul says, we don't walk in sin because of God's grace. But we are, we can know that God allows us to have a right relationship with him because his grace is not, it's, it's sufficient, but it's also greater than what we're capable of doing. Verse, verse six, he says, wherefore he says, now look what he says. God says, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, I've, I've talked about this in first Peter and the other night, but let me go just a little bit deeper. When it says that God resists the proud, here's what it's saying. That God's position is so strong against the proud that it's almost as if God himself is, is lining up in a battle formation against those who are proud. Now, we know that the Bible says that the pride coming both before the fall. We know that. But what this is, is saying that God himself, the sovereign Can't hear you, Pastor. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, Pastor. No, no. We can hear you on the prayer line. Okay, they got me the prayer line. Phone line, you can't hear me. Zoom can. We okay, got you on Zoom. We got you. Oh, on Zoom. Okay, all right. Okay, I got you. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so let me. So it's saying that God is so disgusted and displeased with the pride of His creation. That's us. His people, that's us. That God lines up in battle array against us because of our pride. That's what it says. It said God resists the proud. So it's not just, I, I have been saying that it means that God just said, no, I don't want to be messed with y'all. No, it's saying that God is so angry with our own personal pride that he is ready to, to, to that we become his enemies and he is lining up in battle array against us. That's what it means to say God resists the proud. He resists the proud. He is in a battle array against us. All right, now understanding that, he says this. The proper response to God's position toward the proud is to understand the alternative. The alternative is this. God giveth grace unto the humble. I want us to watch that. The concept of God giving grace means that we're not earning grace. So in other words, if you say, well, I'm humble, I earn grace. I own God, so I'm married to favor. That's not true. What giving God giving grace to humble means that as we are humble before God, that he then gives us out of his the riches of his grace that which we need our humility then puts us in a position to receive the grace that god freely gives i i, I can say that like 10 more times that makes me feel joy being humble before god puts us in a position 
that we can then receive the grace that he freely and abundantly gives. So let me see if I can give us a little example. All right, so let's take this. You go to your favorite drive through So let's just say it's Chick-fil-A. I mean, it could be hard as a Popeye's, whatever it is. But you go there. And if you go to this place and you go and and you have this attitude when you go and, you know, you're talking ugly to the, to the microphone and come around, you know, you're liable to get the wrong order. Anybody, you know what I'm Everybody seen that happen? Mm -hmm. Get the wrong order. I've seen it happen. Not to me, but I've seen it happen. But instead you go and they ask you, is that what you ordered? Yes, of course it is. Um, well, you know, anything else? No, that's all. Fine, thank you. And you come around, and instead of getting just your order, you get other stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a small mm -hmm. tiny picture of what God does. When we are full of ourselves and cocky and arrogant, God says, you know what? You're on your own. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personally light up against you. But when we come with the humility that we believe that God is the only place we can get, in this case, we want Chick-fil-A, it's the only place we can get Chick-fil-A. When God says, if you, when you come to the place where you know that everything you need is from me, God says, then I will give you grace. I will give you what you desire and I give you more. That's what unmerited favor is. That's, not, that's something we can't earn. That's something that God, out of his grace, out of his, 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 his power gives us. But in order for us to get it, we have to be in the right space. In, in like in the right line in Chick-fil-A, it's the right space. What does that mean? A space of humility. That's the way we should walk in humility. So here's what he's saying. God lines up in battle against the pride, prideful, but he then gives unmerited favor freely to those who are on before him. All right. Now we're going to get to what that means in just a minute. Now, James says this, understanding that that reality, pride, enemy with God, humility, grace from God, he said, therefore, we should do this. He says, therefore, submit to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. This concept of submitting is saying, in the light of the grace that God offers to the humble, the only, the only reasonable thing to do is to do what? To submit to God. That means we order ourselves under God. We should surrender to him. Listen to this. Surrender to him as a conquering king. And then and start receiving the benefits of his reign. Let me give you a quick a, a, a synopsis. I think I've said this in the past. When Rome was at its highest and its strongest point, when we look at the books of the Bible like Ephesus and Colossians and Philippians, we see that these nations were under Roman authority. Oftentimes, there was never a battle. Many times when people heard that the Roman Empire was spreading, they would go and send somebody and say, tell Rome, they ain't got to fight. We, we, come on in here. We, we, we're going to voluntarily submit to their authority. Now, here's why. It wasn't out of necessarily fear of Rome, although that played a little role in it. But more importantly, many times they wanted to come under Roman authority and Roman Empire because they knew that being a Roman, um, being under Roman authority would grant them greater stuff. They had better libraries, better roads, better better uh, aqueducts, better services, better things, because Rome, when they took over an area, they didn't you know, come in and burn it down, they built it up. So here's, here's the concept. As we come under the authority of God, just as the people of Philippi and Ephesus and Colossus got reaped the benefits of the Roman Empire, when we come under the authority of God, we receive the benefits that God has for us. What does that mean? We have peace. We have joy. We have provision, we have power, we have the presence of God as we come under his authority. Now, what James is saying is, as we come to that place, as we come under the authority of God, we are then able to, we should surrender to him, not go to battle and then back up. We should just say, Lord, you know what? I surrender, y'all know the song, I surrender all, all into thee, I what? Freely, freely give. That's what it says. And so this is what James is encouraging all the believers to do. Somebody says, well, why do we have to do that? We already surrender to God. No, not all the time. Sometimes we have come, we've accepted Christ as our Savior, but surrendered and surrendering to God is a daily operation. It ain't just you come down the aisle and get a preacher hand and God's your heart. You surrender to the point of salvation. James is now talking about surrender as a point of lifestyle. He's saying that our surrendering to God is to come under his authority daily. That that means that we don't wake up one day and say, I got it. And then when we fall, we say, Lord, help me. It means that every day we come to God and say, God, I'm, I'm under your authority. You direct me, guide me, lead me, do all that it is, and I will accept all that you give me. I will be obedient to you and then receive all that you have from me. That's what it means, that we have come to surrender to God as a, as a conquering king, and then we receive the benefits of, of, his, of, his, um, 
of his of his reign in our lives. His reign in our lives. Um, it's interesting that as we look at this, it it, it it is interesting that this is necessary for James to say, but it is because James understands by the Spirit of God that it is in our flesh that we sometimes rebel. All right, it's in the flesh. So he's letting us know that in our flesh, which is tempted to rebel, that has to be subdued by our what? Somebody say it. Our spirit. Our, the spirit in us that submits to God has to then do what? Overwhelm the flesh. We talked about this the other night. There's always a wrestling match going on, but the more we submit to God, the stronger our spirit man comes, and therefore we're able to resist the rebellion that is inherent in our flesh. Uh, Sister, Sister Christine Gibson used to have me laugh, and I didn't understand. It tickled me one time. She said, what's born in the blood can't be beat out the flesh. In other words, I agree with that. You can have somebody got some, uh, some men, if you can't beat it out of them, but what can happen? Submitting to God, guess what? The Spirit of God can move us to a different place. I believe we agree with that. If you look, if you look at your life, if what's in you, it's in you. But the only way to be victorious is to do what? Submit to God's authority. That's that's the point I was making. I, Sister Gibson was, I, I still quote her a lot. She had a whole lot of little funny sayings. You know, Sister Lydia, you know, y'all saying the same section. All right, so so understand this. So let's talk about what it means to submit to God. Usually I kind of touch on this, but like tonight I like to go a little deeper because I want us to know what it means. And even if I don't finish where I want to go tonight, I like to walk down this road. Here's what submit to God. Here, here's why. We should submit to God as opposed to be rebellious toward God. This is why we should submit to God's authority um, and, 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 and all aspects of our lives. Here's the why. First of all, we should submit to God because he created us. We all agree with that. God created us. We submit to him because he, cre he created us. Your average child submits to their parents because we realize, after all, that's mom and dad. That, that's what we, we agree with that. That's, you know, um, children, you know, my boys are both taller and bigger than me now, but I'm still who? I'm still daddy. It's still it's their mom because that's what mama and then there's a submission because of creation we should have that same position toward god second of all we should submit to god because being on his authority is good for us how many of us can think about our lives before we got saved and think about our lives as a result of our salvation in the whole different life you might live in the same place you might have the same car but your life is different our lives are different why because a relationship with god gives us something that a relationship the world can't give and that is the peace and the joy, as a matter of fact, I can give a list of things. All these things only come through our relationship with God. We should submit to God because it's a blessing to our lives. It's, it's good for us. It's good for our souls. How many can think about, and we might can't remember that far back, but if you could remember before you guys say, don't you sleep a little different now that you're saved? Don't you, don't you look at life as a little different? You don't look at the darkness of life. You look at the joy that comes with knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. We ought to submit to God because his rule is good for us. We here's the truth we should submit to god because and some of us know this better than others resisting god is futile you can't run from him you can't run from you can try and all you're gonna do is be as frustrated all you're gonna do is running from god being frustrated i'm talking about I, I guarantee if we could do if we could do a poll and somebody says when you when salvation was you were in the front door of salvation you said i'm not ready to be saved all you got was frustration till you broke and said lord here i am i come just as i am we should submit to god because um it's necessary for salvation. The only way we can be saved is through submission. You can't be saved. I think I told you a story. When I first became pastor, I had a good friend. He was very successful. And he used to come to the church office sometimes and sit and talk to me. And then um, one day, one night, and I never had a conversation with him about coming to Christ because I, I joined the church because I knew that's not what he needed. I knew he needed a relationship with God through Christ. And so one night he said, well, i never forget it was Saturday night. And it, this was my office was in the other, over there where the conference room is. He said, man, I guess I'm going to come on um, join your church he said how you know what, what do i need to fill out some forms and i was like no you know forms to fill out he said what do you what i need to do i said well, you got to accept christ he said can't you just um and this one said Ms. Elf, he said, can't you just tell the lady to put me on the roll over there i said no i said it requires a relationship with god through christ he said well man you know i, I can give some money i said well you know we don't want your money we want you to have an eternal life we can do it like that what we what you need is, is eternal life with christ it's, it's necessary to about salvation, to submit to God and say, God, I believe that Jesus died for me and that God raised him from the dead. That's what's necessary. And that's submission. That's submission. And as we just said, that's the first step of submission. Then we have to submit daily, but that's the first step of submission. You can't get saved without submission. Uh, finally, we should submit to God because here's the truth. It's the only way to have peace with God. When we're not submitted to God, we're going to have frustrations. But when we submit to God, we're going to have joy. When we submit to God, we're going to have 
um, 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 peace. When we submit to God, the strife that is inherent in our lives, we will find it to dissipate because we are submitted to God. That's what he says when he says, therefore, submit yourselves before God, therefore to God. That's what he says when he says that that's what we have to do. Submit ourselves, therefore, to God. And in doing so, something else happens. Watch what it says next. When we submit ourselves, therefore, to God, and we talked about this before, it equips us to do what he says next. What does it equip us to do? Look at the same verse. Resist the devil and he will free from you. Now, here's the truth. There are only two places to submit, to God or to the devil. Now, somebody said, no, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do. You're not. Okay, when you're not submitting to God, you effectively submit to the devil. Now, somebody said, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, the Bible says this, that this, the, the prince of the air, that's Satan himself, is in this world. We talked about this. He's doing what? He's going to and fro, seeing, seeing who he made to buy it. The prince of the air. I want y'all to remember that. Now, understand the prince of the air. That means that Satan's ways of, in, of, of hijacking or insinuating himself in our lives is so subtle that you don't see it, that we don't see it, period. If we are very honest that, that, that the ways of the world slide into our our minds, our thoughts, our actions. And so whether we can say, oh, I'm doing what I want to do. We're actually not. We're doing what Satan is in, 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 has encouraged us or persuaded us or tricked us into doing. And so James is saying to us and Peter said the same thing. When you submit to God, you're equipped and you're capable then of resisting the devil. Here's the twenty saying. You can't resist the devil in your own strength. Satan is stronger than us, but God is stronger than Satan. All right? God is sovereign. He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. The only way to be safe from the, the, from the terrors of Satan is to submit to God under his authority, and then we get protection. He says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. That submit yourself therefore to God resist the devil we can only resist the devil as we're submitted to God and then he does this next part and I got to talk about this just for a minute he says and he will flee from us you can't because it's a spiritual battle what did Paul say we wrestle not against what flesh and blood but spiritual wickedness in high places and so it's a spiritual battle we face you can't cuss it out. You can't fight it out. You can't wrestle it out. It only comes as a result of our capacity to resist the devil, which is given only to us by our submission to God. Now, but when we submit to God and resist the devil, it says he will flee from us. Now, here's why I, I think I haven't been clear before. His fleeing is fleeting. So that means we have to continue to what? Continue to resist him and submit to God. So we have to continue to submit to God, continue to resist the devil, and he will flee. Because you know how the devil is. He'll flee, and then he'll see when he can slip back in. That's what he'll do. He'll, he'll see, wait, wait a minute, I got him now. I, got, I think I got him now. But then when we continue to resist, he has to do what? Keep on running. Can I tell you what I want St. Peter, members and the body of Christ, the name of St. Peter do? I want to resist the devil. I want to submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee from us. I want him to keep fleeing so much that he had to go down another street. Like, he can't even come down Venetian and Santa. He got to go in Camelton. Camelton, too. He got to go somewhere else. And therefore, we can experience the real, the power of God and the in the light and the and the peace that comes with God, as opposed to the strife that comes with the constant presence of the enemy trying to interact and trying to mess with us. Let's go one more verse. He says, "Draw near to God." This part I love right here. I don't know if there's a. I, I, it's so powerful. Draw near to God. Draw near to God is is very deep because it gives us the understanding that in doing it. God will respond because it says draw near to God and he'll do what? He'll draw what? Near to you. This is what it says. Draw near to God and he will draw nigh to thee. Let me let me see if I can des describe this. Lord, show me this in the car today. All of us that had kids or you've got grandkids now, what makes you happy? When you walk in the door and they come running to you with their little bit of tiny feet, doesn't it make you happy? That is, you just get joy. And they take little bitty foot, feet, little, little bitty tiny foot steps and they run into you. And what do you do? You stretch out your hands and do what? You run and catch them. And because you're taller and stronger than them, you get to them before they get to you, don't you? That's how it works. That's what God is trying to tell us. When we draw near to God, it's just like our little, little kids or grandkids saying, mama, daddy. And that makes us so happy. It makes God happy. And so when we come to him with our submitted hearts and our minds and say, Lord, I just love you, he would just come wrap us in his arm. You know what you do when you got your grandkids? You just reach your arms all around. You just wrap that's what God is saying. 
If you draw near to me, God says, you ain't got to chase me. God is saying, just open up your heart. Open up your mind. Just say, God, I need you. I stretch my hand. There's no other help. I know, Lord, I just love you. Just say, Lord, I love you. And watch what happens. God will move and, and, and pick you up and make you safe and protect you. I love the fact that God doesn't make us see. If God was us, it might say something like, draw near to God over a period of time. And, you know, like, let's say for some one of us, they draw near to Thomas. And, you know, after a while, he might pay attention to you. That's not what God is saying. God said, if you just draw near to me. I'm drawing close. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you to the draw. All I need to do is see you ready to be devoted to me. How do we draw near to God? That's the question. And I'm a, I'm, I promise I'm going to stop. Like, I know I'm out of time. I'm out, I got two minutes. Let me see what I can do. Draw near to God. Listen to this now. Very clear. Miss Simpson, if you were right, somebody write this down for me. Because I, 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 I don't know if I got time to write this down myself. Draw near to God means draw near to God and worship. So here's the thing. Worship. I'm teaching the class. The Lord told me this. I'm teaching the class on devotion. Personal devotion. Draw near to God means that you have your own capacity to worship, to praise, and to pray. Now, I'm glad we got prayer in the morning. I'm glad we have praise and worship on Sunday. I'm glad. But here's what it means, that we as individual Christians say, you know what? I don't really need the organ. I only need to be at the building. If I'm in my car, hmm. if I'm in my house, that I just call on the name of the Lord and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're sovereign. I just, you just declare these things to God that you, that you just have a, a time all by yourself. You don't need nobody. It's just you and the Lord. That's drawing near to God. See, God will, see, you draw near to God by having your own personal time with the Lord. That's where it comes from. See, sometimes we kind of can get busy. And I, I raised my hand. I've been there. But I, I said this to Sims a few months ago. I finally had to realize that, that in order to really hear from God, I just gotta be by myself with God. I I, I can't sometimes I, I can't do it. I love y'all, but sometimes I gotta be by myself. And I think y'all know what I'm talking about. You gotta be by yourself. And 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 and, and sometimes I believe this, God sometimes sits me down and says, you know what, today you don't feel good. And at first I don't feel good until I start praying. And then I forget I'd ever been feel good, but I realized God had to call a time out on me in order that I could have that time with him. Drawing into God is mean having your own personal praise, worship, and your own prayer time to the Lord. Just you and the Lord. That's drawing near to God. Drawing near to God means that you ask God. See, drawing near to God means that you say, God, I, I, I trust you so much that I need you to help. I need to counsel with you. Can I talk turkey? For, can, can I somebody give me a thumbs up on turkey talk? Give me some turkey. I got turkey talk time. We sometimes as Christians, we'll ask advice from everybody. And we don't ask advice from him who knows everything, who is sovereign. Drawing into God means that we counsel with God every day. God, you know what? I got this thing going on. I need you to tell me what to do. Do we understand that God says very vividly in 1 Peter, cast your cares upon the Lord? Why? For he cares for us. God wants us to ask counsel of him. He wants us to consult with him. That is in itself a way to draw near to God because if you counsel with God and, he's, and, and he will give you the right answer. See, if you counsel with your friend, it's 50 50. Really, sometimes it's 60 40 the other way because maybe they don't even know what you're going through. But guess what? God knows what you're going through. He knows where you are and He knows what you need to hear. And so when you come to God and say, God, here's where I am, He will give you the right advice. When that happens, what you'll find out is you're doing what? You're coming closer to Him. I'm going to do two more things. First of all, when you draw near to God, it, it brings you closer because you enjoy your communion with God. How many, how many of us, and I ain't gonna ask you to raise your hands this time, but next time I will. We, how many of us really enjoy our prayer lives? And when we pray, when we get up from, how many times when you get up from your knees, you just feel better? Like when you go on your knees, you might take a whole lot of stuff down on your knees, but when you stand back up, that, that's what that song Jesus said. Sister Mary might be out here. It's, you know, when you go down on your knees, before you can get really down on your knees, already God is lifting burdens. That's, that's when you enjoy your communion with God because it ain't even like, sometimes it ain't even that God has moved the mountain. You just feel better because you know you're giving it over to God. That's why we should draw near to God because we enjoy our communion with him. And, and when that happens, it is transformative. When you get to the point in your life where you have such a serious devotion with God, that's just the idea of going into your time of prayer and praise and worship that you begin to feel better. That is the response that we're looking for because that means that as you've drawn near to God, God has drawn near to you. I, I picture sometimes um, Paul and Silas in the jail, and they just got to praying. They forgot that's that they were drawn near to God. By the way, when they were locked up, remember they were locked up in jail, and they got to praying, and and the stuff started shaking. 
that's drawing near to God. See, when we draw near to God, God will start moving some stuff in your life. He'll start moving some stuff out of the way. He'll start ridding you of some burdens. He'll start breaking chains, breaking shackles, opening doors, uh, clearing out space so that you can fully enjoy him and be free to live for him. I got to stop tonight because I show it. I could keep going tonight, but I'm already over time. But I want us to just remember, if you come back tomorrow night, we can finish this part right here, okay? If y'all tune back in tomorrow, I'm going to come back. I'll be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the same time to go through this. But let's, let's remember this. Draw near to God, and he'll do what? He'll draw near to us. I'm going to stop. God, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for just, just the, the promises and the, this inherent in your word. Thank you, Lord, that, that, that you made it so plain. Submit to you, strengthens us, that we can resist the devil, and in doing so, he'll flee from us. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us, Lord, all we got to do is draw near to you, and you will draw near to us. And that we will fully experience all the things you have for our lives, the peace and the joy, communion, the fellowship, and all the things that you place before us. I pray, God, that this word would just come in our ears and, and, and get in our hearts and get in our feet tonight, that we can live for you, serve you. I pray, God, tonight in every household and every believer mm, and, every, and every family is blessed by this word tonight, that we would hear it and share it with others. I pray, God, tonight that your word, this word would get in our hands and feet, that we'd be better equipped to serve you. Let the word get in our minds so that we can think more about you and the fire dots of Satan can be quenched and we can have peace and surpass with all understanding. Let the word get in our ears so that we can hear these words as opposed to the words of the world. Let your word get in our hearts that our inner man may be strengthened because our inner man has such a desire for communion with you in humility. And Lord, let your word get in our mouths, our tongues, our vocal cords, and our lungs so that we can declare this word to a dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you tonight. Hold on, Zoom line. Let me shout you. God bless you, phone line.